Right, one to be better than the 9 o'clock service. It's 1130. It's 1230. What is the prophetic word over 2022? Expanding territory. Come on, here we go. 2022 is the year of expanding territory. And we have been declaring over our businesses and our families, our marriage, over our lives. First Chronicles 4.10 says this. Jabez called upon the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge or expand my territory and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm or from evil so that it might not bring me pain. And this is my favorite portion of scripture. It says this, and God granted what he asked. We are believing that as you are praying this prayer, your pastor, staff, we, we ourselves are praying this and we're praying this over you as you are praying it, that God is going to grant the areas that you are asking God to personally and spiritually expand territory in your Amen. lives. So you expand the spiritual territory also through the gifts of the Spirit. This is a series that we're in right now, is expanding territory, spiritual territory, through the gifts of the Spirit. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 through 7. And uh, this, is, this is the gifts of the Spirit. It's wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning between the Spirit's tongues, and interpretation of tongues. The five W's of the gift of the Spirit is this. Who are they for? They're for everyone. They're for all of us. What are the gifts of the Spirit for? They're spiritual tools to advance the kingdom or to expand territory. And where are the gifts from? They're from God. When were the, these gifts given? After Jesus ascended and on the day of Pentecost. Why are they important? It's the power to expand territory. This morning, I am ministering on the gift of faith, expanding territory. Amen. And the Lord said this to me as I prayed this week, that faith is the only gift that activates all of the gifts. Let us pray this morning. So Lord, we just thank you that your presence is in this place. We thank you that your glory abides and fills this place. Yes. Lord, we thank you that this place is not just a temple, but each of us are your temple. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would abide within us. We ask that you would reform our ideas, opinions, and thoughts and ways. And that, Lord, your opinions, your ways, and your truth would rule and reign in us. So this morning, Lord, we submit ourselves to you. We say we are your sons and daughters. So, Father, would you do what only you can do to us this morning? Lord, we ask that we would be a people that walk in faith and testify of your goodness. So we declare, let it be done this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, we find the gift of faith actually found, or I'm sorry, we find the definition of faith found in Hebrews 11, 1. And I'm going to continue through verse 3. It's titled this, By Faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation, or they received their good reputation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The message translation puts it this way in verse 1, which I love how it states this. It says, it says it like this. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living for. Amen. It's our handle on what we can't see. Mm. And the act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. Wow. Notice Amen. it says the act of faith. I'm going to get to this in just a little bit. But then it also says that the act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them apart. Amen. So if you are part of distinguished um, uh, business community or marked women's uh, events that you've been to in the past, you know that we chose these names based upon what they
this scripture is actually saying right here. Because to be distinguished or to be marked literally means to be set apart. And this scripture says what sets them apart from the rest, what sets Woo! them apart from the crowd is their Jesus. faith in yes. this. Amen. Woo! So for us to be a people that are set apart and marked by him mm -hmm. means we have to operate in the fullness of what this gift of faith is. So I'm going to break it down for you today because there are two parts to faith. And the first is this, belief. That we believe in God, which is a good thing. And a lot of people believe in God, but it's where a lot of Christians actually stop in their faith. James 2.19 calls it out by saying it like this. You believe that God is one. Well, good for you. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. James is saying, if you want to be set apart, your faith cannot stop at salvation. Your faith cannot stop just believing merely in God, but your faith has to continue after salvation. So he begins to challenge the body of Christ by saying, look, there's no difference between you and demons in hell if your belief or your faith just stops in believing in God. The second part of it is this, and this is where our faith continues and distinguishes us, and it is this, that we are a people that trust God. It is us walking out our faith where we daily have faith or we daily trust in Him. So the second part of our faith that we trust in God means that we obey Him, which is justified through our works or deeds. James 2, 14 through 17 says this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Right. Can such faith save him? Mm. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of them tells you, go in peace, stay warm and well fed, but does not provide for his physical needs, what good is that? So too, right. faith by itself, if it does not result in action, is dead. Right. If our faith does not result in action, it is dead. See, there's been a war, I believe, over faith and works and what James and Paul were really talking about. And a lot of people believe that what they were saying were actually conflicting each other. But I believe if you look at scripture, all throughout scripture, they're saying the same thing. Here's what was taking place during this time period is that Jesus came and he came and he, when he came, he shook everything and everybody up. Jesus came and he shook up the Pharisees and their religious ways. He came in and he shook up the, the, the religious things of looking to a man and putting our faith in a man and doing these deeds that would earn our salvation. And then he came and he shook some things up with believers and followers that said, man, I, we know the Messiah is coming, but did the Messiah really come out of Nazareth? Man, did the Messiah really come from Mary and Joseph? Man, was the Messiah really a carpenter? We see him doing these things, but all of a sudden he began to shake up what their ideas were of the Messiah, what he looked like, Amen. what he was coming to do. And then he came and he shook up. The disciples, his close followers, the thought that a king was coming to conquer, to sit on an earthly yes, throne. Well, right. And when he kept telling them, no, I'm going to be crucified on a cross, they began Ooh. to say, no, Lord, don't Jesus. say that. He said, get behind me, Satan. Ooh. Yes, because you want an offense unto me. No, I have come not to sit on an earthly, earthly throne, but to rule from a heavenly one. So everything in Jesus' presence, when he came, he shook up the opinions, the thoughts, the beliefs of man right. everywhere that he went. So when Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came, mm -hmm. you have the disciples, you have James, you have Paul, now trying to make all these crooked ways straight. You have some people that are now trying to hold on to these religious ways because Jesus died, he's gone, we don't see him. Maybe it was just a fluke that he came. I know he had some signs and miracles, but he's no longer here, and we need something to worship. 
And so people that went back to their religious and old ways, and then there was those like the Galatians that experienced the power of God, the presence of God. They were believers, and they received the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. So as they were going from town to town, they had to know who they were speaking to. They had to bring correction to the crooked things that were trying to come in to steal the body of Christ's faith. So this war has continued, I believe, over faith and works. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Man, Paul is pretty clear right here. That it is not by works or but what by what we do that we are saved. It is by his work that he did on the cross that he paid the price a perfect man. So that we could walk in freedom and the fullness of the Holy Spirit to operate through us. So it is not our works that save us. It is Jesus and his grace and faith through that grace that we are saved. Yet it says after verse 9. It's so funny how we often quote our favorite scriptures and then we stop and we don't finish. In verse 10, it says this, for we are his workmanship created for good works that we should walk in them. See, it is by grace and through faith that we are saved. Salvation is a free gift, yet we are called to walk and demonstrate good works in Ooh. the earth, church. Amen. James went on to say, to say it like this when he was calling out the, the, act, the faith without action being dead. He says this in verse 20. Oh foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is worthless? Was not our father Abraham justified by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith was working with his actions and his faith was perfected by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God or what he had faith in God that was supported by, justified by his actions. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. As you can see, it says in verse 24, a man is justified by his deeds and not by faith. And when you pull out part this word faith, when you study this, this word faith in the Greek, it means not by belief alone. See, our faith in God or our trust in God should ignite us to obey Him and to do His good work. In yes, earth. amen, amen. We are saved by grace through faith, not works, yet our faith is dead without works, or our faith is justified by works. I want to teach this morning because I believe that there has been messages that have confused the body of Christ, uh, the body of Christ on this. We just came through a season where the message of, of grace, but it was really perverted grace, was popular. And it was preached so that burning ears could hear what they wanted to hear. It was altar calls and conferences and performances of altar calls and calling young people up saying, it doesn't what you do. It doesn't matter how you live. It's true, it doesn't matter what you've done. But the altar calls were, you just have to say this prayer and then you're in. But there was no mention of repentance, of turning our lives away from the old lifestyle, the old works, and into him, into Christ. Now my faith, not just what I say and what I profess my belief in him, but that now this repentance has turned my life and shifted my gaze. My faith is now in him. And Jude actually warned us of this. Jude says this in Jude 1, verse 3 through 4. Beloved, although I made every effort 
necessary to write to you about the salvation we share. I felt it necessary to write and urge you to contend earnestly. He is intense in this moment, saying this is a real issue. He is saying, I'm ready to urge you to contend earnestly for the faith entrusted once and for all to the saints. For certain men have crept in among you unnoticed. Ungodly ones who were designated long ago for condemnation. Mm. They turned the grace of our God into a license for immorality. Another version says it like this, for perverted grace. And they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. These mm. men are discontented grubblers following their own lust. Their mouths spew arrogance. They flatter others for their own advantage. I believe that we are in the fruit. We have seen the yucky fruit of this season, of this message of perverted grace. By seeing preachers, pastors, and leaders fall into sexual immorality and doing these things that really believe the same message they were saying to others, that all that it matters is that we're under grace and our works or our deeds or the way we live our life does not matter. Yet the word of God is very clear that our, that our deeds are actually what justify our faith in Jesus. Amen. And so I, I believe that, I believe that although we are seeing the fruit of that season, that we are coming full circle, where we are going to see a generation lead in righteousness and true justice. <laughs> Jude continues in, in verse 5 by saying, hey, let me make this really, really clear for generations to come. Let me give you an example of what perverted grace looks like. And he says this in verse 5. Although you are fully aware of this, I want to remind you that after Jesus had delivered his people out of the land of Egypt, he destroyed those who did not believe. Or actually, this word believe, when you study it, is actually talking about faith with actions justifying faith. And he goes in into verse 6 to talk about those actions. It says this in verse 6, And the angels who did not stay within their own domain, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept eternal chains under darkness, bound for judgment on that great day. In like manner. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them who indulged in sexual immorality and pursued strange flesh are on display as an example of those who sustain the punishment of eternal fire. He is pointing out the actions or the deeds of the people and of the angels that actually justify their lack of faith. Paul says it like this in Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, by no means. Right. Amen. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not right. know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by the baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, the body of Christ, too, might walk in the newness of life. This means that we are saved by his wonderful grace. And through yeah. his wonderful grace, which is not a license to sin, in fact, it is the empowerment to overcome sin, to overcome bondage, to overcome generational to overcome temptation. And this is the other side of this lucky message of perverted grace.
are walking in this place of continual sin, continual bondage, where their faith hasn't truly turned to him. And we are operating in belief without trust in him. But when we begin to trust him, yes. when we begin to set our eyes on him and not our struggles, set our eyes on what he did on the cross, and not sin, all of a sudden we open our eyes one day and say, where did that sin, where did that struggle, where did Hallelujah. that where did it go? Because Woo. we have been consistently walking yes. with our King, Amen. with our focus on Him, walking in grace through faith. We cannot tell a generation or a congregation that you are truly saved by saying a prayer if their faith has not truly turned to Jesus. So how do we know if our faith is truly turned to Jesus? By our works. By our lifestyle. Do our works glorify him? Church, do your works, do your deeds, do your actions glorify him or do our works point to lawlessness fleshliness sin because in this case our works do not justify our faith or testify of jesus and what he paid the price for see faith in jesus means this that our fear has turned to jesus i preached a message on this earlier this year about how the fear of the lord expands territory if you have not heard it I, or if you have not listened to it, <clears throat> I strongly encourage you to go and listen to it because I believe that the body of Christ <clears throat> is in an incredible season where God is about to release levels of authority, work, and signs, miracles, and wonders, but our faith and fear have to be in Him. Amen. Our gaze, when I break down fear, it is not that we are afraid of God, it's that we honor and reverence Him. So it means that nothing else, our faith is in nothing else. That literally it is a wild thing that there is no option B. There is no God if you don't answer then here. No faith in my fear says I am in this in the long haul no matter if you answer or you don't answer. No matter if I look foolish or not, God we are in this together. My faith, my fear is in you and nothing else. Faith should propel us 
to put our trust in Jesus and not just in Jesus, but in his Holy Spirit. See, with salvation through faith comes relationship and with his Holy Spirit. And with the promise of the Holy Spirit comes the gifts that empower us to do good works. And the good works are those that testify of him and expand kingdom territory. I find this in Galatians 3.14. And it starts off like this. It says, he redeemed us in order. I'm going to pause there. Because what he is saying is I'm about to tell you the reason why he redeemed you. He redeemed us in order that the blessing promised to Abraham would come to the Gentiles in Christ yes, Jesus amen. so that by faith we might receive the promise of, of the, the Spirit. Spirit. You break down what it's saying about the Spirit. It is talking about the Holy Spirit, but not just receiving the Holy Spirit, but all of who He is, including the gifts of the Spirit. I believe you, this Lord. is why the body of Christ is so attacked by the religious spirits was to not receive the Holy Spirit and his gifts. Because this is what James was talking about, about a dead faith or a dead church. We have experienced probably a lot of us in this room, churches that are not moving in the Holy Spirit or not moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Because a religious spirit has come to attack the faith of the body of Christ and faith is the gift that releases the rest of the gifts. And so if we can take their faith, if we can steal their faith so that they don't believe for healing, so they don't believe and move in prophecy, so they don't move in, in speaking in tongues and in distinguishing between spirits, come on, if they don't We have some people that are taking some notes and leaving and never walking out what they learned. Come on, we cannot be hearers of the Lord. We must be doers of the Lord. Walk into the political realm. When you 
walk into the education room, when you walk into missions, just walking in his presence with his gifts, and the entire atmosphere shifts because healings break out, signs and wonders, miracles. Thank you, Lord. Can you imagine Woo! in your business? When you stop focusing on just building your business, but walk in the gifts, what your business would do. We would shift this city. We would shift this state. And I believe we're going to. See, this is why fear, intimidation, and doubt persecute the church. Because it is to steal your faith in him so that you're not a vessel of his gifts. Because all of a sudden, when Pastor Jan is preaching on healing, you want it. You desire it, but you're struggling in your faith in that moment because the enemy begins to attack your mind. I'm telling you, he's not going to answer. He's not, he doesn't really do that anymore. Hmm. It's just an emotional moment. They just know how to yell. They know how to lift their hands. It's just an emotional moment. And all of a sudden, we begin to deactivate our faith. You want to know what happens when this takes place, when, we, when the body of Christ begins to take for granted his presence, his glory, and his power. We see it in Matthew 13 through 56 through 58. This is where Jesus lived in his hometown and the people said this about him. Where then did this man get all of these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, the prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. They took for granted Jesus living in their hometown. Just grasp this for a second that everywhere that Jesus went, Pastor Jan preached this last week, he healed all. Do you know that him just walking into his hometown, Ooh. just the presence of Jesus living, sleeping Jesus. consistently in this town, that this town didn't have to ever have a need. They had the Messiah, his presence with them all of the time, yet these were the ones that took Because of your faith, perseveres in 
Jesus, you will receive all of the gifts. The enemy knows that if he attacks your faith, he gets in the way of you receiving all of them and all of the gifts or what will empower you to do great works that testify of his great name. So he continues to say this in verse 3, are you so foolish that after starting in the spirit, are you now finishing in the flesh? Just let that settle. Because he's speaking to us. Everything that you believe for. All of the moments with the tears down your face. The things he's done for you. The gifts filling you. Are you going to finish in the flesh? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If it was really for nothing, does God lavish his spirit on you and work miracles among you because you practice the law? Or because you hear and believe. Yeah. And he says this in verse 6. And he quotes the same. Abraham. So also Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are sons of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And foretold the gospel to Abraham that all nations would be Thank you, Jesus. Those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The Bible is saying that Abraham's faith was justi justified by his works. What work am I talking about when he offered his son Isaac up? He had to have the faith to say to his promise, to his son, we have to head up a mountain today. He had been believing his entire life for this promise. He had been waiting his entire life for God to fulfill this. Believing God, having faith, now he has him and the Lord says, give him back, sacrifice him on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Do you know the faith that it took for Abraham just to get up that day? Mm -hmm. the, the, the faith that it took for him to tell his son to join him on this hike up a mountain. And then the faith that it took for every single step that he took up that mountain. Can you imagine the war that began to wage on his mind as he looked at his promise, as he looked at his son? Jesus. Mm. Every step closer to the sacrifice of his promise. Mm. The enemy is saying, where is your God now? You believed your whole life. What kind of a God would you give you a promise and take it away from you? Can you imagine the words of the enemy in Abraham's mind? Every single step, Abraham decided to take another step and another step. And it was a step of faith. Woo! And it was a step of a work. Said, I'm going to work myself up this mountain.
See, when you can put your faith in him, in him, to heal someone, you are testifying about Jesus. When you can put your faith in him, to believe, to bring prophecy to your unbelieving family, you are testifying of Jesus. When you can put your faith in him, to bring wisdom and solutions to injustice, you are testifying about Jesus. When you can put your faith in him, to believe for the gift of speaking in tongues and worship and praying in the spirit, you are testifying of Jesus. When you can put your faith in him, the justice reform all of it you are testifying of Jesus see some of us have thought that our works of faith are on our own shoulders but that's when we begin to put our faith because we want glory for ourselves but know this if you always keep glory in the right place towards him your faith stays in him and not in your own ability for God to do the miraculous Titus 3 says this But when the goodness and loving kindness of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And verse 8 says this, The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Worship team, come up. Faith in God means that we trust him. When we have faith, it doesn't stop at salvation. It means we are filled with His Spirit in all of those gifts. And those gifts empower us to do good works that testify of Jesus. I want to know something this morning. Church, do you believe that anything is possible with God? Yes. Do you believe that anything is possible with God? Yes. yes.